Okay, so we've seen that anti-Semitism produces incompetence. And that there is this, how do you want to call it, attitude about Jew versus Gentile that whether you're Jew or Gentile gets all fixated on Jewishness. But truth be told, that really hooks the fixation. Hooks maybe what? 20% of the population. I mean, maybe that's, it's a larger number if you factor in the Muslims. But the truth of the matter is that in any set of beliefs, about 80% of those in that group of beliefs really couldn't care less. They belong or esteem themselves to belong to a certain set of beliefs of any kind, secular or religious or even, you know, baseball teams. They group themselves there really not because of the content of the belief, but because somebody in their periphery believes it. So the 20% ends up determining the agenda for the other 80%. And that's true in anything. Anything you want to pick. Because the 80% care instead about what's popular and about fitting in. In other words, 80% of anybody on any topic in the human race is really just disinterested. Lukewarm is what the Bible calls it. The actual motive for adhering to a given position is to fit in with what is considered to be popular or mainstream. Okay, that's true for anything. That's why you have a Best Buy. People go shop at Best Buy because it's a big store. It's institutionalized. That's why people give you respect if you've got a degree at some named university because they have no idea if you're competent. Somebody gave you a degree and you're presumed competent. Even if your degree was in basket weaving, they wouldn't know. They just see initials after your name and therefore you must be smart. There are a wide variety of, how do you want to call it, status symbols that we laud in society, and they're all based on mass marketing. They're all based on uh, an allegation of popular because it's respected, and the respected is based on popular too. That All advertising is geared for that. They want that whatever the brand name is, it needs, it does advertising in order to make the name familiar. That's all they're looking for, is familiarity. Okay? Any idea or any brand name, the whole idea is to broadcast it and get enough people to hear it over and over and then it becomes familiar and if familiar then it must be right. If it's common, if it's familiar, if it's famous, then that gives it a credence because of its massness. Okay? That's what drives people. 80% of the population is driven by familiar, massness, popular. And so if you want to sell anything, I don't care what it is, the key to selling it is to give it a familiarity. And to get that familiarity on a mass basis. If it's familiar and it's mass, people buy it, they give it credence, they give it respect, they deem it true. And that's how all selling works. So 80% of the populace that commonly hears a thing will buy into it simply because it's repeated. So if an anti-Jewish theme or doctrine is repeated enough, 
even if the person himself doesn't regard himself as anti-Semitic, he'll buy into it simply because it's repeated. He won't do any homework because 80% of the human population is completely lazy and is just trying to get by and will do enough or try to be competent enough to fit in and get by. That's all they care about. Okay, they are basically disinterested in everything except in getting by and fitting in. That's their, their God is that. So that's how a Hitler could arise is he made his ideas, which were blatantly stupid and blatantly anti-Semitic, he made them common. And he used the 20% to get the 80% to go along. Okay, and that's true for, for religion too. Okay, the goal is to spread something, repeat it enough, with whatever it takes to sell it, especially being nice, and then it gets popular, and it is not investigated, not looked into, not investigated. That's, you know, um, really, really important. So that you have a whole bunch of people buying into ideas which they don't look into. Because if it's popular, it must be okay. This is why the typical Christian go-along attitude is so damned wrong. Okay, and that's what Second John 9 warns about. If you, he, John warned that if somebody is, holds to something that's anti-biblical, you shouldn't even say hello. Don't even greet them. Which means that you don't even let them in your door. And Christianity routinely ignores that because the Roman Catholic advertised idea was, oh, unity, we ought to get along with our fellow believers, uh-huh. And that's a bid for tyranny. And then what that always does is that fosters the sale of false doctrine. It fosters the sale of not doing your homework. So, if you hate God, and you care about fitting in with your fellow man, and if you care about fitting in with your fellow man, you do hate God. James warned, up, warned about that, too, throughout his letter. Well, then you'll just buy into any old doctrine without investigating it. And therefore, you're a dupe for the anti-Semitic doctrines that Satan sells, which I covered in um, 11F1 which 80% of Christianity buys into not knowing how evil those doctrines are not knowing how anti-biblical those doctrines are so that's why the incompetence is so great because the truth of it is that anybody could discover from Bible itself just how anti-Semitic those doctrines are, like preterism, for example, which Catholicism and Calvinism and Reformed and JW and SDA and many other sects of Christianity, they all buy into that. All you have to do is study the Bible and know how wrong that is. And to see how incompetent are the so-called theologians that have all this illicit respect for centuries. No Calvinist theologian should ever even get a hello they're so dishonest, and their scholarship is so bad. The same is true for the Catholics. But because they, you know, get degrees from universities that don't care about what the truth is, then they have the respectability in the mass. And so people think, oh, it's wrong if you denigrate these people. Hello, they obviously, obviously are in are unbiblical. Obviously, and it's been obvious for centuries. And and we're still nice to them? How come? You know, that's what James was warned about, was warning about. You know, you're sitting here being, you know, friendly to the world, but uh, you're against God. And the Lord, of course, warned about that first. You can't you go after God and mammon. Mammon meant worldliness. True worldliness is to go against what Scripture says. 
I mean, it's no more apparent than with this anti-Semitism nonsense, especially preterism, and getting the gospel wrong, which 80% of Christianity does. You have to ask yourself if most of those people are even saved. It's that bad. And the reason it's that bad is that 80% of the human on any topic is, you know, lukewarm. Just enough to fit in. It's not deemed respectable if you're too interested in the Bible. It's not deemed respectable if you are, if, if God really matters to you. It's only respectable if you fit in. And so a lukewarm interest in God is what's considered respectable for centuries. And the same was true in Judaism. It still is true in Judaism. Just observe the forms. No true interest. Same was true in Rome, even with their pagan gods. If you were too interested in, your, in the pagan gods, well, then something was wrong with you. And it's only respectable to be lukewarm. So that's how anti-Semitism gets to have such sway in history. That's why there were such pogroms. Is that the 20% are determined the agenda of the other 80% by banging the drum, banging the drum, banging the drum, advertising, 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 repeat, 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 until an idea becomes familiar. And the 80% are so disinterested, they're literally being programmed to accept something because it's repeated and because it's familiar. Hitler explained all that in Mein Kampf. Just tell the big lie and tell it over and over and over and over, and people will accept it. I want to say that's in somewhere chapters 8 through 10 of Mein Kampf. Okay. And, you know, he was able to actually practice what he taught. And we still fall for it today. So that's why anti-Semitism has such hold. It's not, you would think, well, you know, only splinters and weirdos are going to get all excited about that. That's the mass doctrine of never be too interested in anything. Okay? That you should only be interested to the extent that a thing is accepted, acceptable and respected, and you are supposed to have a small interest in it. Because they consider that to be the respectable amount of interest. And then they go along with whatever is the prevailing wind. That's considered right and good. Because they're all based on mass. It's mass that's the God, not God. So that's how come you can have a rise and have a widespread acceptance of anti-Semitic doctrines and anti-Semitism itself. Because it just follows this time-honored path of repeat, 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 make it familiar, make it widespread. And because it's familiar and because it's widespread, people will go along with it, even if privately they don't agree. Because fitting in is their God instead of God. So, the incompetence that goes with anti-Semitism speeds through the whole population, even though 20% at any given time at most is going to be the, you know, really interested in being anti-Semitic, it spreads throughout the 100% because of this mass quality that's given it. And that's why the incompetence in Christianity, which is completely puerile in its theology, that's why. Because if you're buying into an anti-Semitic doctrine, then you're carnal. And you won't grow spiritually. You can't grow when you're carnal. And basically, you have to use 1 John 1 9 on false doctrines. If you're believing a falsehood, you're believing a lie, which is the same thing as lying yourself. And that makes you immediately carnal. That's why I use one John 1 9 like breathing. What lies am I believing? I don't know. I mean, I know more truth today than I did, you know, 50 years ago. But how do I know if I'm believing a lie about something else? So the, the antidote to this 
is number one, ask yourself who you really want to be interested in. God or fitting in. And that's always going to be a struggle. Because you've got all these pressures to fit in. Ask yourself what your motive is first. Because if your motive is to learn God and to hell with everything else, then you'll make it out of here. You'll make it out of the morass of the lies that we all are living under. And the second thing is to use 1 John 1 9 like breathing so God can zoom, zoom the ideas to you. Because God works with you. He, he causes you to recall or to understand principles. That's John 14, 26. And if you keep using 1 John 1 9 like breathing, you, try it for 30 days. Make it a habit. It takes 30 days to get a new habit. You'll be amazed at the results. You'll be amazed at how much clarification you get if you just keep using that first like breathing. Try to remember it, you know, every five minutes. Ask God to remind you that you need it. Because you don't know what lies you believe. And you don't know what lies are hooked up to anti-Semitism. And you might not mean it to be that way, but it is. So just keep using 1 John 1 9. And again, the most important part of it is what's your motive? Are you believing in Christ because everybody around you does or because people you care about also believe in him? Or do you really believe in him because you do? And do you know what you believe? Do you know what the Bible really says? How do you know that what you think the Bible says, it actually says? Are you going on hearsay or do you actually know it from the text? And I submit to you, if you only know Bible in translation, you do not know it from the text. These are hard choices, and this is a hard thing that I'm saying. But it's a sad fact of life that most people don't care about anything but going along. That's their God instead of God. And that's why anti-Semitism occurs. That's why war occurs. That's why people end up dying um, unsatisfied and unhappy. Because they never actually want God. They're just going along. And that's not really faith. Not in God. Well, that's your choice to make. Do you want God? Do you want to avoid having beliefs that are anti-biblical, especially anti-Semitic? Then use 1 John 1 9 like breathing. Ask God to remind you when you need it. Because that's John 14, 26 in operation. And ask yourself, why am I a Christian? Or why do I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah if you consider yourself a Jew? Why do you believe it? Is it based on what you know of him from scripture? Or are you just fitting in? Peace out. So now what you've seen is that anti-Semitism can become a mass movement overnight simply by Satan deploying anti-Semitic ideas and doctrines in ways that the masses will consider respectable. And in so doing, he often and almost, well actually always, will make use of the nice Whenever somebody is nice, you should be on your guard. I'm very serious about that. Your most valuable contacts in life will be people who are blunt with you. A person who is blunt has enough, how do you want to call it, independence of thought and discernment to respect you enough to tell you the truth even if the person is wrong about whatever he thinks the truth is you understand by the bluntness that the person values telling what he thinks is the truth value that more than somebody who goes along with you the worst thing to ever hit Christianity is this be nice movement in the name of so called Christian love it's not love it's laziness it's fear of telling the truth. 
and it's hypocritical and it's masked over with niceness. Satan sells every false doctrine by means of nice. The proverbial image of a teacher or a pastor or a priest, you know, with the holy tones usually standing at a graveside citing scripture in a monotone voice. That is passed off as being holy? Are you kidding me? Like a little robot? And we accept that in society is respectable? The ritualistic service with the pews and the stained glass and some figure hanging on a cross, usually with long hair. That's anti-biblical. Christ didn't have long hair. And, you know, the, the fancy clothes and the incense and the ritual and the, the, the little beads that you count. Muslims have their own beads, you know. They stole it from the Catholics. We're calling that holy lighting a candle, chanting some prayer, mindless. All that insults God. And Satan knows that. And he laughs his head off. And we call that holy. And anybody who diverges from it, or doesn't accept it, or who doesn't respect it, we feel a little uneasy around them. Something's wrong with them. Why? Because the mass of the mass is sold as holy and we all buy it. Because it's repeated and repeated and repeated as the image with God's name slapped on it. So that's the motto. That's the procedure. That's the gimmick. Repeat something in a nice voice. And then no matter what's repeated, you're going to buy it. And that's how Hitler took power. Of course, the other side of it is the, you know, the, the stormtroopers, the SS. A little bit of threat thrown in. And the idea of being ostracized by your peers or looked down upon. If you don't do what, the, what everybody does. We all faced this when we were, we were kids in school. There was always this business about trying to get in with the in crowd. And if you weren't in with the in crowd, something was wrong with you. This kind of stuff starts when we're kids. And granted, a certain amount of conformity is needed so that a group of people can do a joint job. But it's used to... How do you want to call it? Force. By psychological peer pressure. A need to fit in in order to be acceptable. This is the heart of good deeds. The whole good deed set thing is sold to make you herd bound. And that way any idea that comes along that's pitched to the mass. With the right tones. It's going to be bought by the mass. Because the mass really don't care about anything else but fitting in. They're all parochial. All they care about is their own little tea and baguette. And my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. And they have absolutely no sense of anything higher. And they don't even care about their brothers, their sisters, their fathers, or their mothers. It's something they, When they say those things, it's to make them feel good about themselves. They have no real love for anybody or anything. Everything with them is mediocre. And this is where incompetence comes in the most. There is no interest in anything except a mild interest of fitting in to get along, to go along. And that's why the common man's values are so parochial. People really don't care about their families or their jobs or anything. They just do what they do to get by. And they have their little tiny petty interests, whatever interest they do have. They're tiny and they're petty and they're parochial. True honor, true value, true virtue doesn't mean anything to them. 
Now, every once in a while, even a person like that will shake out of the mold and actually care about something. But it'll last five minutes, ten minutes, an hour. And that's why there's any competence at all in the world. And when real virtues end up becoming mass virtues, then you see some improvement in competence also. And especially in history anyway, as far as I can trace, when there's been actual curiosity to actually know what the Bible says, then all of a sudden interest in God actually becomes a mass idea. But the masses are all always going along with that idea because any idea that's in the masses, the masses go along. But it does foster an increase in confidence. But it goes, from what I can tell, it goes in like 200 year cycles, at least since the cross. I've only mapped it since the cross. And we're at the end of a 200 year cycle now. We're coming to the end of it. From 1850, roughly, 1850, 1860, maybe even 1870, when all the manuscripts were found. Um, we're coming on the end of that. We're in the last 40, 40 years, 60 years of that. So we're going toward a new demagogue. Because the masses go with what's current, no matter how stupid it is. And what's current now, okay, is this idea of, how do you want to call it, fitting in with the Muslims. There shouldn't be any Muslims by now. But people always want to cave in. They don't, you know, the, the, the whatchamacallit, the mass person is always trying to, you know, have a pie in the sky, Pollyanna idea. Because what he really wants to do is avoid being involved. So he comes up with all these excuses about how, well, well you know, it's a religion. We ought to, freedom of religion. Yeah, it's not a religion. It's, an, it's a terrorist ideology, and it's all laid out in the Quran if anybody would bother to read it. It's a terrorist ideology that is specifically against the Jew. It's the Mein Kampf of the Arab. It is a plan of world domination in order to kill the Jew. And you would see it right in the Quran if you read the Quranic books in the order in which they were written, which is not the order in which they are compiled. You have to go back to the historical dates of the books and you can see it. The last nine surahs pretty much abrogate all the nice things said in the first surahs. I think there's, what, 144, 145 surahs. And the last nine abrogate all the nice ones. You've got Medina and post-Medina. Post-Medina surahs pretty much abrogate everything pre-Medina. Yeah, it was in Medina that Mohammed, you know, went from being just a local thug to being a movement of thugs. And he did it partly by wiping out a Jewish tribe, the Quraysh. That's how he helped get his little band together. And Satan slipped him in the high gear at that point. There isn't a single nation on this planet who should be supporting the Muslims but you know why they do because they really don't care they don't have any sense of history they have no sense of the big picture they just want to go along and they like nice and they love money so the Muslims are tolerated if you're a good Christian, you should pray for the death of every Muslim, death or conversion. Because half of the Muslims are just as, you know, well, no, 80% of them are just as clueless as you are about what Islam really is. And they don't really read their Quran. They don't understand. They don't know. Just like 80% of Christians have no clue what's in the Bible.
So the 80% are responsible for what the 20% are doing because the 80% are going along. And in Christianity, it's all apostate. In Islam, well, if you're a good Islam, if, if you're a good Muslim, you're like Bin Laden. That's what real Islam is about. Bin Laden was a true Muslim. Terrorist. That is what Islam is. Islam means surrender at the point of a sword at your neck. And you get peace. You know, the Muslims always lie and say Islam means peace. Yeah, you get the peace because you've given in because the sword's at your neck. To slit your throat. It literally means surrender. And anybody who's, you know, been in Islam and got out of it will tell you that. That's how I learned it. Now, we tolerate this kind of nonsense. Because we're trying to go along and really afraid to get involved and combat and fight and go to war. And so what God does, and this is what he did to Israel, this is what he says in the beginning of the book of Judges... If you won't fight like I tell you to do, then you'll have these people fighting you until you wipe them out. And that's the way it's been ever since that first part of the book of Judges when Israel entered the land and didn't do what he told her to do. The Palestinians and all the Muslims today are descendants of those people either by bloodline or by belief. So you're going to have to really come to grips with this whole problem. Because we're coming into a war phase now. And I'll say more about that in the next increment.